It's been exactly 24 hours. My legs hurt, front and back. I haven't left my house and haven't called anyone. I know that if I call and report my children missing, that I'm the first person they are going to look into. Nothing will come of it. Nothing. Nothing but endless suspicion looped on me for the rest of my life. Maybe it's better this way. I never wanted them. They never wanted me. They never had a choice. It's better. I was going to hurt them. I was always a bad father and I didn't deserve them. Whatever happens now is better for them than anything I could have ever given them. Anything. What is wrong with my leg? This whole damn world isn't safe and I couldn't have protected them from what was coming. I was too weak. The more I fought to keep them safe, the more I lost them. My leg effing hurts. It's better if you and I forgot this whole thing ever happened. It's been draining for all of us. It led me to places I didn't want to go. I'm going to collect Ellie's notebook and her muddy pajamas and burn them if they're even still there. And then I don't know what I'm going to do after that. Forget about all this somehow. Never look back. Standing in Ellie's empty room, deep down I knew it would end like this. I take Ellie's notebook. The last evidence that she knew her mother will soon be wiped from existence. In my dreams, you are alive and you're crying. Nothing that tells, nothing that tells of what happened can remain. I am a walking memorial. I let it happen. My leg has an open wound that seeps black, thick liquid and will never heal. What kind of parent can't save his own children but lets himself live on? It's only natural that I go too. Why am I letting this happen? I grab the fifth of whiskey from my liquor cabinet and I haven't had a drink since Hannah died. I uncork the bottle and take a swig straight from the bottle. It's a friendly burn as the liquid goes down. A welcoming burn. A must burn too. I go to the garage and grab the red can. The liquid inside sloshes around when I shake it. There's enough for us. I go back to the kitchen and stand over the items I collected that need to be snuffed out of existence, still wet with whiskey. I lift the can over my head. Why am I letting this happen? I anoint my head with gasoline until I am soft with it too. The wound on my leg burns brutally when the liquid runs over the wound. When the can is empty, I throw it across my kitchen into the living room. It hits the wall with a loud thud and shatters one of the pictures on our wall. I come to my senses and walk away. I need matches. For once, I know exactly where to find them. I open the drawer to the right of where I keep my silverware and find the box of matches. I am determined to erase any existence of what happened. Why am I letting this happen? I look down to the wound on my leg, which hurts even worse now. And I notice a black liquid pouring out. I strike a match. Why am I letting this happen? Nothing. That song is stuck in my head. The one that goes, Daddy, please hear this song that I sing. Why am I letting this happen? I strike the match again, still nothing. Why am I letting this happen? I throw that match away, must be a dud. Daddy, please. Why am I letting this happen? I pull out another match, I'm I'm having struggle standing at this point. Daddy, please. 
wake up. I fall to my knees. The match and the box are still in my hand. I still want to eradicate myself. When am I letting this happen? Why am I letting this happen? Why am I letting this happen? Why don't I care that my children are gone? Maybe dead, gone forever. Why don't I care? It's my damn fault. I never wanted them. When they tried to talk, I didn't listen until it was too late. But you still loved them and gave them what you could. Not enough. I couldn't protect them. I couldn't save them. All I ever did was fill them. Of course I loved them. You still love them. You were playing a rigged game from the start. You can't be blamed for losing to a cheating universe. I was a bad father. Everyone knew this. It was obvious. It was intrinsic. It was hamartia. You look for the past yet. You're afraid to chase after them before they are gone forever. You are a defeatist, but it's not your fault. Every single day you are told to give up, to focus on the bad and not see the good is worth fighting for. You can save them. No, I can't. I screamed at the top of my lungs and grabbed at the wound on my leg. My hands are covered in thick blackness that pours out of my wound. I was aware again. I threw the matches out of my hand. I don't want to die. I need to save my children. I'm not sure what the best thing to do is right now. I want to report my children as missing to the police, but I worry that if I tell them about what happened, they're going to think I'm crazy and that I hurt my kids. Plus, this wound on my leg is disgusting. It's still pouring black and pussy and open. I think I need to take matters into my own hands. I know there is no reason for you to believe this, but I will be a better father if I can save them. I'm going to patch up my leg and then I'm going to brainstorm. I guess it's time to be clear. Those two times I saw Stickman in my room were real. I lied to myself because I was scared. I have two similar wounds on my leg. One is on the back of my thigh from the first time I saw Stickman. It's nowhere as large as the other. It doesn't hurt like the other, but it's also black. I didn't notice it until now because I wasn't looking for it. The one on the front of my calf from the night when he... That one was disgusting. I think he drugged me with something. Now that I think of it, I did feel groggy ever since the first night I saw him. Ever since the events about 24 hours ago. I was in a complete haze. I don't know why I snapped out of it. But that's not for me to worry about right now. I need answers. I love my children, but I have failed them this time. And many others. I won't let Stick Man get away with this. I won't lose them. I looked through my son's room. I opened his blinds and looked over the front yard. I should have paid more attention to him. He was so unhappy here. Even before my wife died, I convinced myself it was just his disposition. That he was an inherently sad child. But it's so much deeper than that. I found his journal, and on each page, he talks about how he misses our old home. As a kid, he used to watch the people in the street going about their lives. Unlike me, he always liked people. He trusted them. In a recent excerpt, he writes, I would watch them and tell myself they were going somewhere interesting. Hear the passers-by do nothing and go nowhere. They just jog their hours away until their days are gone. This is the place where everything dies. I keep my curtain closed so I don't have to see the dead people. He writes frequently of how watching his mom get sick and slowly die scarred him. And he knows that the fate awaits everyone he's ever met and loved. I really feel sick to my stomach. 
How the hell could I expect him to grow attached to a place where his mother withered away and died? I really was a horrible father. I didn't know Michael had this sadness that he couldn't let go of. I should have been there for him to at least let him know he didn't have to go through it alone. I just found the sketch on a sheet of paper in his drawer. I don't know what it is, but I think, but I'm thinking that maybe it's the thing Ellie drew with the giant eye floating above our house. It's the drawing of a cross-like thing that what looks like eyes all over it. And he writes, he sees all at the bottom of it. Started digging around Ellie's room when I heard a blood curdling scream coming from the forest that I heard the night before. It's my only chance. It's only 7 p.m. right now. It's starting to get dark. Here's my plan. I'm going to look through the woods. If I can't find anything, I'll call the police and report them missing. I'm losing precious time, and it's because I'm dragging my feet again. I just know they won't believe me. I grabbed a flashlight and went outside. The empty garage bins were still where I left them when I ran back to the house, forgotten in a frantic panic. I have no plan now. I'm just going into these woods. I have to find them. I walked for what felt like miles until I finally found a trail deep in the woods. I was on the right track. I followed the trail for a little while. I felt lost in the trees. I felt hopeless, like a weary lost traveler. If I just laid down and died, would anyone find me? That's when I heard the scream again. It was loud, so I knew it was close. Hello, I called out. Is someone there? I shone the flashlight along the tree line to my left, which is where it sounded like the screams were coming from. A frantic woman in tattered clothing jumped out at me. She was covered in mud and dried blood. She huffed for air frantically. I tried to make eye contact with her, but it was like I wasn't there. Ma'am, are you okay? I asked. She screamed at the top of her lungs and ran past me back into the trees. She wasn't my problem. I followed the trail, which twisted and turned and wound like a snake through the trees. I couldn't tell you where I was in relation to my house anymore. I heard rustling in the trees. I prepared for the worst. Out of a bush came a sweet brown dog. He looked happy and healthy and came right up to me. I petted him and checked his collar. Keaton. He would be 18 years old at this point, meaning he should be old and decrepit. But he looks like he hadn't aged a day since the day he ran away. I thought about bringing him back, but I couldn't afford to lose time. I kept walking, leaving the dog behind me in the darkness. He'll be okay. I walked and walked and walked, and I couldn't find anything. I started to lose hope. The trees felt infinite and omniscient, like I never escaped them. Desperation. Listen, I know you're effing out there somewhere. I know you can probably hear me. I will burn down these effing woods if it means finding you. Show yourself. I kept walking. It was a bluff. I had left the matches at home. I walked for a few more feet when it started to rain lightly. Great. I wasn't wearing a raincoat. The trail snaked downwards into a clearing, whereupon I was faced with a forgotten scene. My flashlight worked its way over rusted heavy machinery, some rusted cars, and a long dwelling made of wooden leaves. I went inside and found long forgotten wooden bowls strewn about the more recent additions. There was a gold pocket watch mingling on a table with a smartphone from the mid-2010s. I didn't have much time to take the scene before I heard a familiar sharp hissing of air expelling behind me. I turned and left the dwelling and was face to face with Stick Man. Well, he towered over me. He was almost twice my size. I looked up to him. 
I looked up to the top of him, but did not shine the light on his face. Where are my children? He tilted his head back and looked into the sky. What was he looking for? Listen to me, damn it. Where are they? You're either going to have to kill me or take me to them. He stayed fixated on the sky. I looked up too and saw a dark red light in the sky, like a dark star coming to land on top of us. There was a flash of light. I felt like I was floating. I can't exactly put into words what I saw. I felt like I was surrounded by bright darkness. I felt like I didn't have a body anymore, while also feeling like my body was stronger than ever before. Stickman was not there anymore, but I was not alone. I sensed a great presence there with me. I wasn't sure if I could speak, but I spoke anyways. Where am I? A deep voice boomed through the bright darkness. You're where you want to be. Who are you? Suddenly I saw a gold circle with a gold circle covered in eyes. That never blinked. At its center there was one giant eye. The voice boomed again. Why do you seek me? I, I didn't. I felt like an ant being interrogated. This thing had to be about 500 times bigger than my body. Yes, you did. I know why you came. I want you to say it. I, I want my kids back. They were taken from me. The thing was simultaneously distant and right before me. Did you take my kids? No. Still, they are here. I suddenly felt braver than insignificant. You have to give them back. Someone will notice they're gone. The voice boomed again. People go missing all the time. People ignore the truth all the time. Humanity has the uncanny ability to ignore inherent truths and to dismiss them. Nothing more than obstacles to what they want. Even if some did accept the truth, their own lives would get in the way. They forgot about it when the next thing needing attention rears its head. Then they'd forget about that one too. I know humanity. I need not listen to you. I felt insignificant again. I asked, why did you take them? The creature didn't answer. Instead, it made me feel something. I suddenly felt the pain of millions of people. I was simultaneously shot, burned, injected, flayed, drowned, made to live in fear and squalor. I choked on air and drowned on my innards. The voice boomed again. This is coming. Cannot be stopped. It can be stopped, but it won't be. It showed me mass graves forgotten for years. It showed me bodies strewn about the streets of the cities. It showed me a sea of bones. I just wanted this pain to stop. I couldn't hear it anymore. I asked, Are you Mr. O? The voice boomed. I have been giving many names. The first you gave, Kanto Karas, Ofen. I knew that was a yes. I think I understood my children deserve better. I said nothing, but I think it was a yes. I suddenly saw a scene of a man begging the sky for his children to be returned. I can't fix all these things. I didn't cause that. The voice boomed. No, so many are not responsible yet, yet all are punished. I understand. If there is nothing worth fighting for, then keep my children, let them be loved by their mother and save them from what is to come. But if things can be saved, then please let them return to me. Give me any chance to take them from me if I fail them again. That's all I'm asking. I am back in my front yard now. I don't remember how I got there. It's dark and raining out, but I'm scared to go inside. I don't think I can handle it if they aren't in there. One thing I felt when I was in that place, where they were, was that I won't be going there ever again no matter what I do. If they're not in the house, I likely won't ever see them again. Staring at the house, I see no signs of activity inside. Michael's blinds are shut, my room lights are off, and the lights in the foyer are on like they usually are. That's all I can see from the front yard. If my children are there, 
I will love them and be there for them like I always should have. I will never take them for granted again. I will never let myself sink into the hole believing I can't help them. If they're not in there, I will report them missing and live with consequences and I won't ever stop looking for them. I walked up the driveway and I went inside the house. I crept up the stairs very slowly, praying that they would be in their rooms, praying that I would get to see my kids again and have one more chance. As I crept towards Michael's room, I knocked at the door, and that's when I heard him say, Dad, hold on. He came and opened the door, and I just had tears rolling down my face. I just hugged him and held him and cried. And I told him I'm so sorry that I have not been here like I should. Everything's going to change. We will move. And that's when Ellie came out of her bedroom asking what was wrong. I told her nothing, sweetheart. I just gathered her into a hug as well. We all three stood there in the hallway and I just held them and hugged them and kissed them and I cried and I told them I love them so much and I am going to be a better father. Everything's gonna change. That's when I thought to myself and looked up to the sky. Well played, stick man. Either way, I think this is where our time together ends. I wish you well and beg you to challenge yourself to care and fight even when things seem hopeless.